start though, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, for those of you, very few of you who may not have met me yet, my name is Debbie Douglas and I'm the Executive Director of OCASI. This is an OCASI policy uh, webinar. We do a series of these webinars um, from time to time. You will know that there's another webinar coming up um, next week, I believe, um, that we'll be looking at the new pathways that was recently announced by the federal government. But today, we're all about health and we're all about COVID and COVID vaccination. It's a one hour meeting. We will have a presentation and then we will go to question and answers. Um, there are, we are expecting over a hundred of you. I think right now there are about a hundred of us on the call. Um, so we, 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 we beg you <laughs> to keep muted. I know um, it's excited. Um, when it comes to the Q&A period, if you put up your hand, um, if you put your question in the chat, then I will either read the question or I will come to you and ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question directly to, to Isaac um, and Meb. We are recording the session. So at the end of the session, it will be posted on the OCASI YouTube channel with a link to the OCASI website. Everyone who is registered will receive a link to the recording. So you can um, use it for whatever purposes you need. Once again, you may enter any question you may have as the speakers, as Meb is presenting and, and or even when Isaac is speaking so that we so that you don't lose your question and we will come to you after the presentations. So we are delighted to have with us Drs. Meb Rashid and Isaac Bokoch. Dr. Meb is the medical director of the Crossroads Clinic at Women's College Hospital and assistant professor at the University of Toronto. I'm going to ask that his very long bio be <laughs> posted in the chat. Um, Dr. Isaac Bokoch is an associate professor at the University of Toronto Department of Medicine and is an infectious diseases consultant and general internist at the Toronto General Hospital with a focus on tropical diseases, HIV, and general infectious diseases. And his bio will also be posted in the chat. Again, a longer bio. So thank you, Meb. I will turn the screen over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, so I'm going to start by just going through a few slides to give you a little bit of a background uh, in terms of where we're at um, with the COVID rollout and what we know about the vaccines. And then Isaac, who's our COVID celebrity, is, uh, is going to field most of your questions. As you know, Isaac's been very involved in not only getting information uh, out to people, but also he's on the um, uh, provincial tables in terms of the vaccine rollout. So uh, let me start with this and hopefully we'll be able to answer a lot of your questions uh, through these slides. Uh, but please, 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 uh, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, as Debbie said, and uh, we'd really uh, are, are trying to save a lot of time for this to be interactive. So I want to maybe first start with what I think we all recognize is that this pandemic has not affected everyone in the same way. We know it's certainly uh, what we're seeing here in Toronto and across the province is that it's affect racialized communities, low income people, people uh, and new immigrants and refugees in much higher uh, levels than it has uh, in other parts of the population. I think what I really feel is our onus is to keep well informed on what's going on out there so we can share this um, as as hopefully as, as people who are trusted in the community uh, so that we can provide information to the people who are serving and make them feel more comfortable with the decisions they make around the vaccine. So let's jump right in. Now, uh, if I was going to take the vaccines, the questions I'd want to ask is, look, how effective are they? Do they work? Um, what are their side effects? And with particular attention to perhaps the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, uh, do the vaccines work against the variants? And then uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the rollout, which really is a moving train, right? Like every day it expands, but we'll tell you where we are as of at least a few hours ago, right? So just in terms of that first question, how, how effective are the vaccines? So um, how to, to answer that question, I'm going to take you back to the clinical trials in which these vaccines were actually approved. So the, the trials for these mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer biotech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, they took place uh, the summer of 2020 and they were massive trials. So the Pfizer biotech vaccine uh, trial had over 40,000 participants, the Moderna trial over 30,000 participants. Um, most vaccine trials will have six, 8,000 participants. So these, uh, when it comes to medical interventions are huge trials, right? 
How do they work? Well, during these trials, half the people get the vaccine, half the people get a placebo, and they follow people to see how many people will get sick uh, with, with COVID. Um, in the Pfizer trial, one thing was unique was that they actually um, allowed people to enter if they were 60 years of age or older. All the other trials were 18 years of age or older. And when you looked at these, the interval for the vaccines in the trials for Pfizer was 21 days, for Moderna was 28 days. Okay, so they give half the people the vaccine, half the placebo. What do they find? Well, quite amazingly, and again, this was well beyond anyone's wildest expectations. These vaccines were 95% effective in preventing COVID. Right uh, now, this is up there within the realm of the most uh, effective medical interventions, uh, certainly in terms of vaccines uh, that exist out there. Right, so Pfizer 95% effective, Moderna not, just over 94% effective after the second dose. What's also really important to recognize is that these numbers, this 95% uh, efficacy, uh, this was across all age groups. This was across gender and race and ethnicity. And both these studies had a fairly good proportion of people who were racialized. Um, uh, so very, very reassuring, right? Uh, uh, for these studies. Now, what about the, the other two vaccines that have been licensed in Canada, AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson? Now, with AstraZeneca, there were actually two studies that were released. Now, I'm quoting data from the US study, which I think was a much better study. Oops, I'm just going to stop this. Um, uh, again, people 18 years of age and older. The Johnson Johnson study was 43,000 participants. So again, a huge study. Um, AstraZeneca, the dosing interval range from four weeks to 12 weeks. And what's interesting, of course, about Johnson Johnson is it's a single shot, right? Which makes it unique uh, in terms of these four vaccines. So what did they find? Now, AstraZeneca came in at about 76% efficacy. Uh, Johnson Johnson overall was at 66%. But if you look at different... Uh, arms in that trial, it was 72% effective in the US, 61% in Latin America, and 57% in South Africa. Now just keep that in the back of your mind because we're going to get back to that 57% in South Africa. You know, a lot of people look at these numbers and say, look, that, that's not 95%. Right? Uh, we just told you that the RNA vaccines were at 95%. Remember, these studies were done in different populations at different times. Okay, so um, both these studies on AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson happened at a time where there were more variants, and that certainly could explain the difference. So it's really hard to compare those numbers. But all that to say, all four vaccines were shown to be quite effective in terms of preventing COVID. Okay. Um, when we look at preventing COVID, that's one thing. What about preventing severe illness, right? Uh, how do we keep, a, you know, if, if COVID ends up being like a cold, it's not the worst thing. But how do we keep people out of the hospital? How do we keep them off oxygen? How do we keep them out of the ICUs? Well, look, when you look at these studies, these vaccines are really 100% effective in these studies uh, at keeping people out of hospital, at keeping them out of uh, ICUs. And that's really uh, one of the most important things we're looking at in these vaccines. So really reassuring news. Okay, so th those are studies. Those are artificial uh, parameters. Uh, I mean, good studies and big studies, but how have these vaccines been working in the real world? Um, this is one thing I found to be really influential. We all know that ground zero for the COVID pandemic in those first few waves were in long-term care homes, right? Tremendous suffering, tremendous number of cases, tremendous deaths. And, you know, this is a horrible slide I've cut and pasted. If you look, on January 14th, um, you can see that we had 1,650 residents in long-term care who were infected with COVID. Right, across the province of Ontario. Uh, now, remember, this is a population that was targeted as a priority population. They got two doses of uh, mostly Pfizer, Moderna vaccine. And what did we see? When we look in April, okay, uh, 10 cases, right? Now, this was at a time that COVID is surging across the province, right? And we've gone from over 1,000, over 1,500 cases to 10 cases in long-term care homes. Why? I think it's a really good example of how, of how amazingly effective these vaccines are, right? It's, uh, it's really, in many ways, COVID has disappeared in long-term care homes. Now, I should say since April, we've seen that number climb a bit, but it's still well below 100 residents uh, who, are, who are infected with COVID, right? At a time when we'd have thousands. What about across the world? Now, Israel was one country that was really quick off the mark in terms of vaccinating. So mostly with Pfizer, 
small country, uh, they were able to dispense the, the uh, vaccine very quickly. And you can see that they hit this peak in what looks like at least their third, maybe their fourth wave, uh, where there were over 75,000 people infected. And at a time where really across the world, the vaccine, sorry, the, the virus is proliferating, um, it's gone away, right? It's almost gone away in Israel. People are sitting outside in cafes in Israel. Uh, the other country where we've seen the vaccine really disseminated very quickly is the United Kingdom. And in the UK, it's been predominantly AstraZeneca, a little bit of Pfizer, but uh, predominantly AstraZeneca. And you, you can see, again, going into March, their numbers have plummeted, right? And have stayed low through April and May. So I think these are really good examples of how effective these vaccines are. It's not just vaccine. There's, you know, certainly people are socially distancing. There's other um, measures they've taken place, but certainly vaccines have played a role in this. Uh, these are highly effective vaccines. What are we still learning? Look, uh, people often ask, will I need a booster? Or how long will this vaccine be effective? Um, maybe I can get back to you in about two years when we have that data. Remember, these vaccines have only gone into arms for the last six months. Um, what is reassuring is that with both Pfizer and Moderna, they published studies uh, at six months showing that uh, they still remain quite effective. So we might very well need a booster if that immunity wanes. We might need a booster if there's new variants. Uh, but at this point, the coverage is, is still very good. The other thing that a lot of people ask us is, do the vaccines prevent spread? Sure, they prevent illness. But is there a chance I could be infected and then still pass it on to the people around me? I think increasingly there is evidence showing and kind of makes sense. If you're not symptomatic, if you're not catching it, it also helps to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So, so again, that's very reassuring. And some of that real world data that we looked at from the UK uh, and Israel also speaks to that. All right, so are they effective? Tremendously effective, these vaccines. The second question I'd want to look at is what are the side effects? So sure they work, but what are my risks when I'm taking it? Well, the good news is for the vast majority of us, those side effects are gonna be exactly the same as any other vaccine that we get, like the flu shot. So we'll get pain in our arm where we get it. We might feel like we're coming on, uh, a cold is coming on where we get a headache or chill lakes, uh, but that goes away in a couple of days and you know, people can certainly take Tylenol or Advil or whatever it is if it becomes really problematic. More infrequently, you can get redness and swelling at the site of injection or nausea or vomiting or enlarged lymph nodes, uh, but those tend to be more rare. Uh, I would suggest that more we're see although these side effects are minor, we're seeing them more frequently than we do with the flu shot, right? So there's similar types of side effects, but perhaps more common. Saying that, they tend to be transient. Um, serious allergic reactions, what we call anaphylaxis, can happen, but are, again, are exceedingly rare. And remember, you will not get this vaccine in any place where there isn't somebody there who could take care of an allergic reaction. Right? There will always be staff and equipment there to help people if they get an allergic reaction. If you do have allergies to food, if you do have allergies to penicillin or other antibiotics, uh, it's new to these vaccines. Okay. If you have a severe allergy, what we do is we monitor you for a little bit longer after you get the vaccine, uh, but that should not be a reason for you not to get the vaccine. The only... Um, Compounds we know that are in these RNA vaccines in particular that can cause allergies are something called polyethylene glycol and polysorbate. Now, you might not have heard of these, uh, these compounds. They're, they're actually all over the place. They're, they're in cosmetics. They're in over-the-counter uh, medications. And if you're allergic to those, then you should speak to your doctor about it. Those allergies are really rare. Like in 25 years of practice, I've never met anyone who's told me they're allergic to polyethylene glycol or or pause sorbet, but um, uh, if that is the case, then certainly speak to your, your uh, doctor or nurse practitioner uh, and they can guide you through that process of getting the vaccine. But any other allergy, the common allergies we talk about shouldn't be an issue. The other thing for me that's really reassuring is when we, when we talk about side effects, I mean, many people ask us, do we really know the side effects? Look, um, as of a couple of days ago, as of May 9th, there were close to 1.3 billion, billion doses of COVID vaccines that have been provided worldwide, right? And, you know, I, I think you can argue this probably hasn't been a medical rollout uh, that's been as closely scrutinized as this one. You know, you might have remembered in December when the UK rolled out uh, their vaccines, uh, someone fainted and, you know, made it on the front cover of many uh, international newspapers. Um, people are watching. Um, you know, and on that note, um, 
you know, I, I, let's speak about the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson vaccine and this relationship to blood clots. In many ways, I think this, um, this issue of blood clots shows that the system is actually working. These rare, rare side effects are being caught. Uh, there, people are being informed about them. As clinicians, we're being told to watch out for them. Um, so what do we know? Look, as all of you probably have heard, uh, sometime uh, we started to hear the signal coming out of Europe of a, a really unusual type of clotting disorder. This isn't the type of clots we see in people who are on the birth control pill or who have cancers. It's a bit unusual in that they're associated with a decrease in the cells that actually cause clotting. So the platelet cells actually go down. That usually makes us bleed more. But in this case, we're actually finding that with these low platelets, uh, people form these clots and often in unusual parts of the body, places we wouldn't expect, like the brain. Um, it's a very rare side effect. Uh, something we've seen with the AstraZeneca vaccine, the risk, you know, is still settling, but I think most people feel it's about one in 100,000. Some countries have shown it to be a little bit lower, some a little bit higher, uh, but somewhere in that ballpark. Remember, if you're in a place where this is the only vaccine that's available to you for a few weeks, uh, there's a lot of COVID, uh, which was the case certainly here in Ontario a few weeks ago. Uh, to me, it made absolute sense to take the AstraZeneca vaccine. You've all heard that a few days ago, uh, or last, at the end of last week, the, the province has actually put a pause on the rolling out of AstraZeneca vaccine. There was a slight increase in the number of these unusual clots. Uh, so they have put things on hold. I think the other major driver of that is we have a ton of Pfizer vaccine coming in. Right. So, um, you know, we really uh, it wasn't like it was three weeks ago where, you know, if I wanted Pfizer, I might have to wait three or four weeks. And if I was in a position that was very high risk, uh, it made a lot of sense to take AstraZeneca. There is lots and lots of vaccine coming into Ontario right now. And we'll, we'll speak to that. People do ask, what do I do if we if I got, if I got AstraZeneca as the first dose? And I think it's somewhere around 850,000 people in Ontario. Um, so we're still waiting on a study that uh, is being done in the UK right now, they will look at the idea of mixing vaccines. I think most of the smart people I speak to are very optimistic that if you took AstraZeneca first, uh, you know, if that second dose is Pfizer or Moderna, uh, people are confident that it'll be as effective, if not more so, but we're waiting on that data. The other thing that we're, um, we're recognizing is that the risk of clots is actually quite, is much less common on that second shot. So it might be that AstraZeneca is quite safe for that second or much safer for that second shot uh, than, than for the first one where I would still argue it's still uh, quite safe and you know again to contextualize that this is a really um, unusual and, and rare side effect although although a serious one okay so um, the other question we frequently get asked is how effective are the vaccines against the variant so um, still a lot to learn the main variant that's circulating here in, in Ontario right now is this B117 variant that was identified in the UK. And the good news is, as you saw with the data on COVID uh, in the UK, um, where they predominantly used AstraZeneca, uh, as well as some Pfizer, both Pfizer and AstraZeneca seem to work very well against this B117 variant, right? So if the effectiveness is decreased, it's decreased just a bit, uh, certainly not to the point where I think any of us are worried about it, right? What about that strain that was identified in South Africa? So there was a study uh, that was just published last week that came out of Qatar. And Qatar is a place where half the strains they have are 135, this strain that was identified in South Africa, and half of them uh, were that strain that was identified in the UK. And they found Pfizer still quite effective, 72% effective in that, in that study out of Qatar. Um, you remember that slide I showed you about Johnson Johnson in South Africa, where it was, I think it was 56% effective. So still effective, but less so than it was in other places in the world where there wouldn't have been as much of this variant. Um, AstraZeneca had published a study uh, earlier, and although it was a small study and there were probably methodological, methodological issues with uh, it, showed that it really wasn't very effective in at least preventing mild and moderate uh, uh, 
symptoms of COVID. So, um, so that's one to watch. But I think most of us are confident that uh, that uh, the vaccines we have will work well against the 135. We have less information on the strain that came out of Brazil and the and the Indian variant that you've all heard about now. Um, there are a lot of studies that have taken place in the laboratory, but in terms of effectiveness in, in real people, we, we still, um, we're still still waiting for that information. But again, I think most of the experts uh, are confident that these vaccines will be quite effective against these strains. All right, so hopefully, you know, we've talked about how effective they are and they're incredibly effective. We've talked a little bit about the side effects, right? Uh, and we've talked a little bit about the impact on the variants. The other big issue is, look, once you decide you want to get the vaccine, how do you go about getting it? Who's eligible and how is it being rolled out? And this really is like a, I mean, it's it's a, it's a truck going down a hill really fast. Um, I was just saying to Debbie before we started that, uh, you know, I, I got something on my a notification saying the rollout to kids is starting next week. And uh, much of this presentation will already be outdated by the time I finish it. So let's take a look at the current rollout. We are here the week of May 10th. And right now, as of today, the provincial age ban has reduced. So anyone 40 years of age and anyone who's turning 40 this year and older is entitled to get the vaccine. As we move down the list, this hotspot age ban. So anyone over 18 years of age who lives in a hotspot, and we'll talk about that, is uh, uh, entitled to get the vaccine. People with at-risk health conditions now have been added to the list of people who can get the vaccine, and then people who cannot work from home. Okay, so let's tease that out a little bit to see who's eligible. So let's start with this hotspot age ban. This is a list of all the postal codes in Ontario where, uh, if you, where we've seen a high burden of COVID infections, and thus people who live in those postal codes have access to the vaccine. Anyone who's was 18 years of age older can get the vaccine uh, if they're in these postal codes. Now, um, this, if you need this information, you can just Google it, it pops up pretty quickly. But the province of Ontario has this website. Uh, there's a lot on there, but uh, th this list of hotspot communities uh, is also on there. Okay, what about these at-risk health conditions? So as of Tuesday, all these health conditions that you see on, on, on this slide, uh, if you have uh, diabetes, if you have hypertension, if you have asthma, you can now go and get the vaccine, right? So this is a tremendous number of people as well. And again, uh, you know, if you wanna look at the list, I direct you to that, uh, that province of Ontario website. Now, what about those can work, that cannot work from home? Again, a long, long list of, um, of employment positions that would allow you to get vaccinated, including grocery workers and people who work in pharmacies, uh, social workers, uh, you know, people who work in transportation. Again, a long list, bank branch staff. Uh, and again, if you want to pull up that list, that's on that same website. So we are on the verge, by May 24th, anyone who's over 18 years of age in this province, that week will be entitled to get the vaccine. So, you know, we've been sort of cutting and slicing and have some people, yes, some people know. Uh, I think as, as the vaccine lands here in a big way, uh, it's going to be much easier to determine if you're eligible for vaccine, right? Okay, so if you decide you're eligible or you've got somebody you know who's eligible, how do you get it? Um, well, there's a number of options. There's these mass vaccination clinics. Some of you might have seen the city of Toronto where I'm at runs a number of them. Uh, they can they can put two three thousand people through in a day, often in large you know football fields and soccer stadiums. And uh, um, uh, to access those uh, mass vaccination sites, the province has a website that you can access. You punch in the information; it'll tell you the sites that are near you. You look and you see if there's availability for uh, for the days that you want. The only problem with that site is that if you don't have OHIP, it's a mess, right? It'll direct you to a phone number. That phone number directs you to the public health unit. In each public health unit, they have a, a different process. At this point, they're trying to uh, have community organizations field some of these calls. So many of you will know the FCJ Refugee Shelter or Access Alliance. Um, they've put themselves out there uh, and are in the position then to help people uh, without health cards navigate the process. Uh, those that want to use the mass vaccination clinics. There's also hospital clinics. A lot of hospitals have just run and done this on their own. So in Toronto, for example, we must have 15 or 20 sites that are run by the hospitals. Um, 
it's a bit clunky. You have to go to each hospital site. And if you're in Toronto, vaccineto.ca is a really useful website. Uh, you know, all the sites are on there, but you have to go to each one. All of them have different criteria to some extent. You have to look at each date and look at the availability. If they don't have it, then you go back to another one. The great thing about the hospital sites is generally you don't need OHIP, right? So for Myself, I work with a lot of refugee patients who only have coverage by IFH. Uh, this is my go-to. I will go to those hospital sites first, unless people have OHIP. You've all seen the mobile clinics. These are the pop-up clinics, usually run by community organizations uh, in conjunction with hospital partners. They will land in what tends to be an area that's a hot zone, an area where there's lots of COVID. Uh, it's often, some will We'll also book appointments, but for a lot, it's uh, it's first come, first serve. So you've seen the lineups in front of these clinics. Often they're vaccinating two to 3,000 people a day. Um, and uh, and they've been highly effective in increasing uh, the number of people in these hot zones who've actually been vaccinated. Um, some primary care settings have been able to get vaccine. At our hospital, we ran a couple of clinics with the AstraZeneca vaccine. We're hopeful to get Moderna uh, in the future, and uh, we're still working on that. And then pharmacies. So you might have heard last week that uh, uh, pharmacies now will have Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. They were handing out AstraZeneca vaccine, handing out, they're rejecting AstraZeneca vaccine uh, for quite a few weeks. Uh, and there's a list of, of um, pharmacies uh, on that provincial website as well. All right. Uh, finally, COVID uh, vaccines that are free, many people have asked, particularly people who are uninsured. Remember, you should not need an OHIP card, okay? Um, you know, people have been looking at this, any type of identification um, uh, uh, with address on it preferably helps, but if you don't have that, there are clinics that'll help you navigate that process, all right? It, it is not a requirement. So I am going to stop there and pass it on uh, to my trusted colleague, who I think will be able to field uh, most of your calls. Um, and uh, thank you. And uh, we look forward to a robust conversation. Thank you very much, Meb. And um, you did cover some of the questions that were um, popping up uh, in the chat. Um, Isaac, do you have opening remarks before I go to the first question for you? Uh, thanks for the opportunity. No, I mean, uh, uh, Meb gives a very comprehensive overview of where we are in terms of COVID-19 and especially the vaccines. I like how we covered uh, not just what the vaccines do and up-to-date data on vaccines and, and emerging and circulating variants of concern, but also the evolving policy in the province. And quite frankly, the convoluted sign-up system as well. Uh, I think that's very important. I think our time is best served with uh, fielding questions from people on the call. And I think between Nev and I, hopefully between the two of us, we should be able to get most of them. And if there's something that I, I can't uh, answer now, I'm happy to touch base and, and uh, report back if I need to look something up. Very good. So the first question uh, to the two of you, does having the time period of four months between the two doses of the Pfizer vaccine have any effect on its effectiveness? Um, and a follow-up question is, Canada seems to be the only country, uh, developed country with a four-month um, wait period. Um, why? I can take that one. Okay, let's start with the second part. Yes, Canada does appear to be the only country with a four-month waiting period. Why is because we have a shortage of vaccines, full stop. If we had a, a non, if we didn't have any supply issues, we'd be giving everyone vaccines as per the dosing schedule of 21 and 28 days. I think that's pretty clear. Having said that, let's dig a little bit deeper. Why was 21 and 28 days chosen? Well, if you waited longer, like two months, three months, or four months and had data for that, it would take way longer to conduct the clinical trials. We would only be having the results of the clinical trials coming out now. So th those shortened durations were chosen so you, so you could have actually a shortened time frame to do the clinical trials. It's well known in the infectious disease world that separating dose one and dose two by a little bit, put an asterisk, we'll talk about what a little bit means, but separating dose one and dose two actually provides a more meaningful immune response, okay? So taking this sideways for a second, if you look at AstraZeneca, which we're not really using much anymore, the dosing schedule separated by three months provides a more significant immune response than the dosing schedule separated by six weeks, by four to six weeks, okay? so. It is important to separate the doses. Now, four months is long though, four months is long. And for the vast majority of us, 
it's probably okay. It probably is for young, otherwise healthy people or people that have a, a you know normal functioning immune system. It's probably going to be fine. Where I think we'll run into some trouble is with the older end of the people on the older end of the spectrum and people with underlying medical conditions that may prevent them from mounting a more robust immune response. In Ontario, we're giving second doses fast to Indigenous communities, people with various types of cancers, people with organ transplants, and people on dialysis. If it was up to me, I'd expand that list a little bit. I'd include people over the age of 80 and some other medical conditions, but it's not up to me. So that's not why we have it. The other important thing on this front is if you do, if you shorten the duration of time between dose one and dose two, if you increase the number of people who should have a shortened duration of dose one and dose two, you slow down the vaccines. It's as simple as that, right? You, that means it just takes a lot longer to get a first dose into everybody. I'll stop blabbering on and on. I have one other quick point on this. The first dose fast approach is working, right? If you look at Toronto, over 50% of adults have a, have a dose of a vaccine in them. Um, at the end of this month, over 65% of adults, eligible adults in the province will have a first dose in them. That's gonna tra it's, it's not going to transform our epidemic. It already is transforming our epidemic. Yeah, two doses is better than one. One dose isn't complete, but one dose really, really helps. Like it significantly reduces your risk of getting the infection. It also significantly reduces the chance that you'll land in hospital. And it may be premature, laugh me off this call. I think we're actually starting to see the benefits of the first dose fast approach in Ontario. And I'm eating crow here because I was the guy on the news saying, we're going to policy our way out of a third wave, not vaccinate our way out of a third wave. I shouldn't say this publicly, but it turns out if you don't have good policy with time, you will vaccinate your way out of a third wave. And that's exactly what's probably happening. So anyways, here we are. I hope that addresses your question. If you have any other points on this, uh, I'm, I'm happy to chat. Very good. Um, is Pfizer safe for children 12 to 15 years of age? And a related question, um, when can uh, young people under age 18 get the vaccine? Easy. Short answer, yes, and in June. Okay, longer answer. The study of 2,000 people didn't show any safety signals. Um, I know I'm going to also get in trouble by saying, you know, children are just young and little adults, which isn't true, they're not. But like, eh, come on for a second. We're not talking about six months to 12 years. We're talking about 12 to 15 year olds compared to like the trials were in 16, 17, 18 and 19 year olds. Like it's gonna be okay. It, it is gonna be okay. Um, I'm, I don't have issues with this personally. Uh, we'll likely start to see those cohorts eligible for vaccination in June. Related to this question and the question before, because of the increasing vaccine supply, we will also likely be doing second doses before four months, not at four months. So starting in June-ish, maybe mid-June and onward, we'll probably bump up the time frame for people to get their second doses. But I can't look you in the eye and tell you with a straight face that that's 100% going to happen on everybody. It will probably happen. And I hope we prioritize that to people who are over the age of you know, 60, 70, 80, or people with medical conditions. Thanks for that. I've been um, saying that to folks as well as um, our supply increases that we most likely will be heading to second dose sooner rather than later. Um, what about someone who is breastfeeding? Are all of the vaccines safe for breastfeeding people? Yeah, I mean, this has been mostly studied with uh, Pfizer and Moderna, and uh, there's been some good studies demonstrating no issues with safety or efficacy with breastfeeding individuals. And in fact, I mean, there's been some small studies that have actually demonstrated benefit. Um, they've looked at uh, antibodies, maternal antibodies to COVID-19 in the breast milk and calciparese, they're there just like other antibodies should be. So you actually provide passive immunity, passive protection to the breastfeeding child, which is yet another amazing example of why breastfeeding is an incredible thing and protects the child. So you know, good news. Uh, if a pregnant individual gets vaccinated and then is breastfeeding, they will pass along likely some passive immunity to their to their child. Sweet. Good. Um, after vaccination, can you carry the virus to others? Yep, you can. Uh, so vaccines aren't perfect. They're just 
these ones are really, really good, but like no vaccine is perfect, including COVID-19 vaccines. Even in the clinical trials, we saw people who had two doses of the vaccine still get infected. But if you take a step back and you look at the big picture, the risk of getting COVID-19 two weeks after your second dose of a vaccine goes down like significantly. And then furthermore, the risk of you actually getting sick and dying from COVID-19 two weeks after your second dose of vaccine, of course, it's not 0%, but like it goes down dramatically. And there's just a gazillion studies from real world data from the UK, from Israel, from the United States, just showing, showing this. It's pretty impressive. But of course, it's not 0%. No vaccine is 100% perfect. You can still get the infection. You can still get sick from the infection. You can still transmit the infection. But the, the likelihood of all of those goes down significantly. Very good. I'm actually going back into the questions, although I have them um, written down um, so that I can have some other voices other than my own. Um, Maha, I'm going to come to you. Maha Reyes, um, want to have a question? Maha, you can unmute yourself. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, this is Maha Reyes, Settlement Counselor from the Windsor Women Working with Immigrant Women Organization from Windsor, Ontario. Actually, I think I disturbed the whole uh, um, presentation with my questions. I have many concerns. It's not coming from me, uh, actually. It's from other clients. Uh, oh, that's we, fine. That's good. Yeah. So all these concerns, I hope, uh, I think I put it um, in a very clear way. Um, I hope we can get... Uh, like answer for my questions. However you answered, I mean, for the first questions, thank you so much. So we have more and more. So if you just look what I've been uh, wrote okay. there. So I'll, yeah. I'll read them out then. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, um, Isaac, are individuals who have already received the full doses of COVID-19 vaccine still able to carry the virus to others? Yep, they can. It's just much, much more rare for them to do it. So even if you've been vaccinated, you can still catch the infection you can still transmit the infection, but it would be a very rare event. Uh, it's just, again, we're not living in a world with 100% certainty or 100% protection, but like by being fully vaccinated, you would reduce, you, you protect yourself. You also protect those around you. It's just not 100% protection. And it's like still incredible. Like it reduces the risk by probably over 90 to 95%. I think Meb answered the following question in his presentation, but what about folks with A fever or asthma? Um, can they have the vaccine? Yep, no issues whatsoever. It's in fact very rare to have an allergic reaction, like a true allergic reaction to the vaccine. Listen, lots of people will feel crummy after the vaccine. After AstraZeneca, which we're not really using so much now, uh, about a third of people will feel crummy. After Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, about 15% of people will feel a little crummy but you won't feel too crummy. You just feel crummy for a few hours or a day and you get better uh, on your own. And, and, and that's that, like it doesn't land anyone in hospital or anything like that. A true allergy to the vaccine, a true allergy, like where you need an EpiPen, the uh, epinephrine injection is extraordinarily rare. You can measure it anywhere from two to six per 1 million. <laughs> so it like, yeah, it can happen. It's just probably not. And uh, what happens is all the centers that are administering vaccines have trained personnel and an EpiPen on site on the very, very, very rare uh, scenario that that happens. Very good. Um, Edgar, do you want to um, ask your question? Edgar Yanez. Oh, thank you. Yes, the, these questions have to do with um, patients who are taking medications for that lower the immune system response, so for example, like methotrexate or uh, things for arthritis, they're considered on medical conditions, but I have heard that in some countries like in England, they, they ask them to continue the medication, but here in Canada, some doctors are asking to stop the medication for a while. So is there any, any concerns that that may probably interact with the, with the vaccine or maybe cause a less effectiveness in the vaccine? Yeah, Edgar, you've got a great point here. There's two, two responses to that. For starters, um, yeah, of course, when people are on these medications that suppress the immune system, you don't mount the same degree of an immune response to the vaccine. That happens. All the reason for those individuals to get two doses quicker rather than one dose. But still, even with one dose or two doses, 
even with that suppressed protection that they get, they still have some protection. And I would take some protection versus zero protection by not getting the vaccine. That's point one. Point two is everybody's different, right? All of these, the reasons to be on those immune suppressant drugs is different. Some people have to be on them to prevent their cancer from coming back. Some people have to be on them to prevent them from getting a multiple sclerosis flare and they won't be able to walk. Some people are on them to prevent their lupus from flaring up and they'll, their kidneys will shut down. Some people might have lesser reasons to be on them. So it's very individualized. In some instances, you can temporarily pause those immune suppressing drugs and get a vaccine and then restart those immune suppressing drugs two weeks later. Other people don't have the leeway to do that because it will be dangerous to stop their immune suppressing drugs. Regardless of if they stop them or not, you still should get the vaccine, whether you're on those drugs or not, because you will still mount some degree of an immune response and, and get some degree of protection. Yeah, and a similarly related question from Maha is, would receiving the vaccine negatively affect any underlying medical conditions? Fairly broad question. Uh, I think it would be rare. Like, I think it would be rare, but probably not impossible. Like, you know, the, these vaccines, for example, in the acute period after vaccination, you know, any, if you take uh, the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the, the Moderna, about 13 to 15% will feel a little blah, a little bit of malaise, a little bit of a fever, okay? After AstraZeneca, it's closer to 30% will feel a little blah. If you have an underlying medical condition that already causes you to be fatigued and weak, yeah, sure, you're gonna have more fatigue and weakness and it's just gonna be, it could be challenging. But in general, you're gonna be fine. You know, I don't mean to say suck it up and tough it out, but in all fairness, like plan ahead, you know this can happen, Take the next day off or get your vaccine on a Friday so you, in case you're affected by this, you, you, you can relax on the weekend. Just think ahead. And, and in all fairness, most people don't have this. And if you do have this, it's actually, um, it's actually pretty, pretty mild. Very good. Um, Jacqueline Balia, would you like to ask your question out loud? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, it's um, I was reading like recently about like um, if you have your period and you go to take the vaccine, right? So I don't know if that is recommended. And other thing is like um, the vaccine can have like a very, very rare side effect, like can give you a very heavy period after or like uh, no periods at all. I don't know if it's true or not. Thank you. Yeah, Jacqueline, that's a great question. And this seems to come up from time and time again. Full disclosure, I mean, I'm happy to chat about infectious diseases, but I'm not a fertility uh, or you know, gynecology expert. So I have reached out to my gynecology colleagues and fertility colleagues on this, widely available online from just about every fertility expert on the planet, is that this is not going to affect fertility, but this comes up from time to time. And in terms of altering uh, a woman's period, I mean, my gynecology colleagues basically say it maybe it does maybe it doesn't and no matter what it's not a big deal it doesn't stop your period from happening so if there is an effect they're not too concerned about this as being anything major and causing any you know in their words not mine that would be a minor nuisance and that's about it maybe anything to add okay thank you very much no thank my pleasure you. No, I would agree. And I think it, it would be so rare that, you know, if someone misses the period, they should really think about other things as well. So, yeah. Um, Macy, you have your hand up. Macy Tatari. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I have heard from two people that had, that have um, lung cancer, which when after a uh, vaccine, they felt much better regarding their appetite, their fatigue, and their um, breathing. I was wondering if there is, uh, or there might be a research for this kind of people or different kind of cancer that this uh, vaccine might help them. Wow. Macy, I mean, certainly I'm a huge proponent of vaccines, but I've got to be totally transparent here in that as much as I think they're safe and effective and we should all be getting them, I can't say that I've heard of any positive benefits of vaccines related to improving people's feelings and symptoms regarding cancer. I would love for that to be true. I'd be very skeptical that that's actually going to pan out, but always an area to look into for sure. And I hope your friends are doing okay. Thank you. Very good. Um, Christina, Christina Munoz. Yes, 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to to ask the first question uh, regarding for the children uh, that they are getting that was approved the, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, I am wondering, is it safe for children with allergies, like seasonal allergies? Because I don't know, I hear it, but I don't know if it's true that the Pfizer vaccine uh, it like creates more like aller allergic reactions to people that get it. So that's why I was wondering if it's safe for kids that ha have specific allergies. I've been diving in a quick Q&A. Meb, sorry about that. You want to, I don't mean. Yeah, um, so yeah, you know, the allergic reactions people seem to be getting with vaccines aren't really related to the the allergic rhinitis we think about, the, the hay fever, runny nose, sneezing. So that should not be an issue for adults or kids getting the vaccine. Uh, that really should not be a problem at all. Thanks, ma'am. Yeah, Christina also had a question about travel. Is it safe to travel after having two doses of the COVID vaccine? I was gonna say as soon as our borders open, but doctors? Yeah. <laughs> I wish. Um, you know, I, I guess everyone has a different risk tolerance, but remember when we're traveling, we're traveling often with people from all over the world, right? So as Isaac has mentioned, and what I was showing you with those slides is that, you know, your chance of getting sick is uh, in those studies, you know, is very, very small, but it's not zero. So if you are going to some place and you're mixing with people from all parts of the world, and we know, you know, the vaccine rollout will be different globally, that's something to think about. The other thing that comes to my mind, because I really do miss traveling also, is, uh, you know, if you end up sick somewhere else in the world, right, uh, you really are going to have to adhere to their protocols for dealing, for testing and quarantining people with uh, possible COVID or with COVID. And that's something else to think about. Saying that, I think we're still a long way away from um, from getting to the point where, where borders are completely open. Um, the other thing that's that's uh, maybe something to talk about as well is the whole idea of a, a COVID passport, right? Is to have some kind of documentation you have to show to be able to travel. And we're already seeing this in terms of the European Union and some countries who are saying, look, we're gonna open to tourism uh, perhaps later this year and in the summer, but to come, you have to show us proof of vaccination. I don't know what you think, uh, Isaac. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, uh, just because you're fully vaccinated, for sure you have uh, greater protection. You absolutely do. But, you know, even though things are slowly starting to get better in Canada, it's pretty ugly outside of our borders in most, most of the world. you got to be very careful where you go. Uh, healthcare systems are stretched. You might not get the care you need. There's a lot of reasons to be careful. Um, having said that, things are going to change for the better and they're probably going to change soon. Um, I think we're actually going to hear more advice from the federal source, from federal leadership about what is acceptable and not acceptable following two doses of a vaccine in Canada. And stay tuned. I, I know they're working on it. I wish they would have had that <laughs> out a month ago, but uh, here we are. So I think we're going to hear more from federal leadership on this front. Very good. Being mindful of the time. So um, heads up, uh, we might go five minutes over. Um, so I'm going I to apologize. Give... I do have to jump off. at the Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to give you um, two or three questions at the same time. Good. So um, if someone has taken the vaccine a week ago and gets COVID and then tests positive, is it still dangerous for them um, in terms of the COVID and how it will impact on them as well as um, after the two doses, will we be expected to take booster shots in the future? I think, Meb, you had um, addressed some of that in your presentation. Um, can you take the, the vaccines when you're menstruating? So um, we'll go through one by one because I've got a short, short, short term memory. If you get the vaccine, if you get infected one week after you get the vaccine, you may, may, may start to see some benefit of the vaccine, it'll be very early. That might mitigate your severity of illness. You might not get this sick, you might get this sick, but that's pushing it. Usually the early benefits are at about 14 days after the first dose of a vaccine. And going back to my short, short-term short memory, what was the second question? The second question was, um, can you take the vaccine during your period? Yes, absolutely. Well, and the third one? Um, the third one, you talked about travel, 
Um, you talked about being dangerous. Oh, um, would you have to take the vaccine every year? Oh yeah, the boosters. The Listen, boosters. For, yeah, we're, no, so I don't know. Sorry, let me rephrase that. I don't know. We're all gonna get two doses of a vaccine. That's pretty clear. We're all gonna get two doses of a vaccine in the 2021 calendar year. It'll probably all happen before September or in and around September, we'll all get our second doses. Great. Um, after that, I think it's fair to say in 2022, we'll all probably get a booster dose. That's probably fair to say. Beyond that, I don't know. Um, and we just, I don't think many people know. What's interesting is Canada has already put um, uh, money down and contracts down for boosters for 2022 and for 2023 as well, in case we need them. So good to know that we'll be protected if we need this. But um, I think it's fair to say 2022, yes, onward, I just don't know. If you, if you um, test positive for COVID, can you get vaccinated? Yep, you sure can, and you should. Um, if you, usually, you know, you have to wait till you're feeling better, but you know, anytime uh, within three months after someone's been infected, they can get a vaccination within a three month window. Anytime is fine, but usually we'd say keep it within three months. Okay, what about sooner? Like if I, if I have, can yeah. I have COVID before I recover? Can I get vaccinated before I recover? It really start to feel better. You technically can, but like here in the hospital, there's some people that we know they come in with COVID, when we discharge them, we know it's going to be challenging to follow up with. Even though we bend over backwards to accommodate people and do the right thing, sometimes people will have difficulty following up and we'll give them a vaccine as they're heading out the door. Okay. So for folks who have been who received AstraZeneca outside of Canada and are now coming to Canada, will they have to start all over again or will they just get their second dose in Canada, be that AstraZeneca or another um, it, vaccination. Yeah, you got to have evidence of your vaccination, right? Like wherever you get your vaccine, you should definitely have evidence of this because we, perhaps we can enter this into our provincial. Um, sorry, give me a sec. It's code blue. I don't know if you get it's loud over here. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, yeah, it's like hospitals. So you should you need to bring evidence of your first vaccination. Uh, and then like anyone who's got a first dose of AstraZeneca, everyone's getting a second dose, right? Like I know people are concerned. I know people want answers. I appreciate that. But like, if you got AstraZeneca, first of all, great. You got a good vaccine. That's a fantastic vaccine. You protected yourself and those around you. My wife got AstraZeneca. I'm so glad she did. Um, secondly, everyone's going to get a second dose, right? You're either going to get a second dose of AstraZeneca or you're going to get a second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, like you're going to get a second dose, you're going to have good protection, and all is going to be well. Very good. Um, Faten, I think your question was answered about whether or not you can get vaccinated while sick. Um, sickle cell, um, Meb, I think you talked about sickle cell disease as one of those conditions. What about people with the sickle cell trait? Can well, they? Yeah, in, its, in itself, sickle cell trait really isn't an illness that puts you at higher risk. But again, just hang on another week and a half and everyone will have access to the vaccine. Very good. What about uh, folks who are planning to have children? Um, will the vaccine cause any complications with getting pregnant in the future? That's a crystal ball question. I wasn't paying attention. Sorry. No. <laughs> um, for for um, I can people planning, that one. for people planning, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Right, so this has come up over and over and over again, and I think part of this comes somebody who put out on the internet four or five months ago that there's part of the spike protein on the virus that's similar to something that's in placenta. Um, but this has been shown uh, repeatedly physiologically to be inaccurate. Yeah. Also, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, in those original studies, there, although pregnant women weren't actually part of that study, We've seen people get pregnant. We've seen people who were pregnant when they got their vaccine. Uh, it really doesn't seem to be an issue. Most major organizations of obstetrics are recommending women get the vaccine in any trimester they're in. So, uh, you know, I know I see that as one of your questions as well. So if yeah. you're pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant, please get the vaccine because we know COVID is a mean disease in pregnancy, right? You do not want to be pregnant and catch COVID. So get, get that protection. Yeah. How, how effective have the vaccine been in fighting the new variants? They're good. They really work. They're not as good as non-variants, but they're still good. Like they still provide some protection from COVID-19 
and they keep you out of hospital. Like, look at the, it's not that the, look at B117. That's the variant that was initially discovered in the United Kingdom. That's like 90% of our COVID in Ontario. <laughs> like, it's like, it's not even a minority of cases. It's like the vast majority of cases in Ontario. These vaccines work beautifully against this variant. Like, these are really good vaccines. Yeah, we'll all start, need a booster in 2022. Yeah, you still need two doses, but like, these are good vaccines. I apologize. May I uh, may I jump off and hand this to uh, Dr. Rashid? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Isaac. We truly appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. And I'm, again, if there's more questions, I you want another one of these? I'm 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 always happy to chat. We'll be knocking on your door again in a few weeks. To it. Take care, everyone. Great to see. Great to see you. Great to see you. So, Meb, thank you for staying. Um, do you know anything about the Sputnik vaccine out of Russia? Um, is it an mRNA vaccine or, uh, I'm sorry, or it uses a vector virus? Yeah, How effective so, is it? So the two other vaccines that we've seen that are being widely used across the world that we don't have access to here are Sputnik and Sinovac. So Sputnik was produced by Russia. Uh, it's a viral vector vaccine. Um, and it's one that there is some data that's come out of Eastern Europe. I haven't followed it as closely because it, it just isn't on our, our on the trajectory here. And it doesn't look like it will be given how much Pfizer we have. So there is some data that shows that um, it has been uh, uh, relatively effective. Sinovac is uh, coming out of China. Unfortunately, there is very limited data on Sinovac that I've seen that's published. There are some rumors, um, you know, Chile has used it in a big way. Uh, it's certainly been accessible to some countries around the world. There was some concern about a third dose being required of Sinovac, and I don't know how that's settled. So, um, so these are, I, I don't follow the data very closely on these two, but they are being used and they are being used globally. And when we talk about those 1.3 billion doses that uh, have been circulated, certainly Sinovac and Sputnik make up a percentage of those. Um, so Tim P and Biba Sin, your questions have been answered around fertility and breastfeeding. Um, yes, go ahead and get the vaccine is what both of our doctors are saying. Um, Sudeep is saying, we have heard through our vaccine engagement teams that some family doctors are discouraging their patients from taking vaccines. Um, another issue is they have heard is that mRNA interferes with the DNA. That has been something that we keep hearing at the front doors. Um, will you comment please now? Yeah, so, so it's absolutely wrong, and, and here's why, and I don't want to take you back too far into your grade 11 uh, biochemistry, but what mRNA is, it enters the cell, uh, remember the DNA is within the nucleus of the cell, the mRNA never makes it to the nucleus, it's in that cytoplasm, the external area, what happens is it goes into the cell, it then uh, ends up producing proteins that are manifested on, on the cell surface and released into the bloodstream. So uh, it doesn't come anywhere near the DNA. It doesn't affect the DNA. That should not be an issue. So, um, you know, that's one question we hear about frequently, and that's, that's just plain a misunderstanding. Um, in terms of family doctors who are discouraging their patients with vaccines, I would encourage those patients to find new family doctors. I, I just think the science around this is so clear um, you know, it is like someone giving you cigarettes to, to, to smoke when, when you come in with a, a cough. Uh, to me, it's, it's just bad science. So, you know, one of the things that I have found very frustrating about this is when I speak to my patients who are all new immigrants, right? They're all new immigrants, uh, all refugees. These are the folks, when I call them, they're on public transit, right? Going to their jobs in long-term care or in factories. And they're sifting through this type of advice and this type of misinformation, uh, which just breaks me because they are at such high risk. And we have seen so many of our patients get sick, particularly in the last six weeks. The people I know who live in Rosedale and Lawrence Park, who are at home right now whilst we talk, getting Amazon delivered to them, they, their doctors are telling them quite clearly, get the vaccine. And we know from data uh, until the hotspots were prioritized, they were the people who were running out and getting the vaccine. So there's certainly been this distinction based on class. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm really glad that the province has now targeted hot zones, but this type of messaging, it, it's really landed uh, with a lot of uh, the patients I serve. And it, it's, it is very frustrating. So I think any doctor out there who's telling you not to get the vaccine, um, I, I think you're getting dubious advice. So. Here, here. And I was going to say, you learned about cell and DNA in grade 11 biochemistry. I guess I just skipped that class too much. Probably out of grade seven. <laughs> it's a longer time to forget. 
Uh, if someone has had COVID and now has antibodies, does that protect them? And if so, for how long? Yeah, I can't give you an absolute answer. People will say two to three months. We know those antibodies wane with time. So although it's not common, there's well-documented cases of people who get COVID twice, right? So we know those antibodies will wane. And that's why, you know, we encourage people. Uh, I mean, uh, Isaac said really within the first couple of months after your infection to get, uh, to get the vaccine. I've had patients of mine, I get them vaccinated, you know, after their two weeks, right? After they're finished their period of isolation. Sometimes I'll wait to a month, right? And I don't feel bad if they're waiting, you know, uh, six weeks or eight weeks or even up to three months because they will have some immunity. But that immunity doesn't doesn't last. And for patients like mine who are such high risk, I really do want to boost that immune response with uh, with that vaccine. Cassandra, I hope you heard um, Meb's answer about the doctors who are discouraging folks. Uh, Cassandra says that whenever she talks about getting the vaccine, a lot of her friends, including um, some of her nursing friends, and I, I was actually sharing this with Meb earlier about nursing friends of mine as well. They share links from Michael Eden, who was the ex-head of Pfizer. Um, so how, how do we, how do we um, ba balance those two things? Yeah, I mean, there's always voices. I, I've heard of this uh, this head of Pfizer, but I haven't really followed his arguments. There's always going to be voices, right? There's always going to be voices. You know, when I think of some of the most successful interventions uh, in history, things like measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, uh, you know, whatever, clean water, there's always going to be people who are, who are oppositional to that. And, and in some ways, I think that's important because it keeps the discourse moving forward. Um, you know, my concern always is with, with vulnerable populations, right? And how some of that is landing on the people who are suffering the most. Uh, and, you know, like with so many infectious diseases, there's such a disparity, right? We're seeing the poor, the racialized, the new immigrants who are being infected much higher rates. So I'm particularly sensitive to those people getting uh, bad advice. I can't speak to Michael Eden's uh, particular arguments, but I, I know there's people out there who will we will put out there all sorts of information. Um, I think most of the scientific community, 99% of them will, will disagree. Thank you. I just realized that I'm very late for another session. I'm moderating. But um, Bivasin, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. If someone has COVID, can, should they continue to breastfeed? Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't be an issue. Um, actually, I pause when I say that. I, I don't think it should be an issue breastfeeding. Uh, depending on how old that child is, uh, ideally, if you, if I, if I'm a woman and have COVID and I'm living with my young child, we will try to isolate them. Right. And I was saying that that's almost impossible. Right. In most cases. So if you are isolating, uh, if you're able to isolate, then you will have to break the breastfeeding. Right. Uh, and that's partly because of the breastfeeding. It's really just about distancing and space. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Meb. Um, lots of questions. Um, we will be back in the next few weeks if we have new developments on this front once again. Uh, thank you all for your questions. This has been a very informative hour and a bit. Um, looking forward to seeing you all soon. Have a great afternoon. Join us next week on the new pathways that the Immigration Department just announced. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.